Tonight on Super Size vs Super Skinny... Ain't you ever hungry? Super Skinny Sam and 35 Stone Michael fight their food demons in the clinic. That there is a year's worth of your crisps. Michael crosses the pond for some stateside shock treatment. This is absolutely one of the worst ways to live your life. And we meet a young man who successfully kicked back against anorexia. I'm 24 years old. Like, come and get me. Experts calculate that by the year 2050, obesity and its related illnesses will cost the UK £50 billion a year. At the other extreme, anorexia has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder, with 20% of sufferers dying prematurely from their illness. As a result, Dr Christian has opened the doors to his feeding clinic once again where he's taking on terrible diets at both ends of the scale. He's inviting eight super sizers and eight super skinnies to swap meals and face their dangerous diets head on. Michael, come on forward. So, Michael, I have paired you... ..with Sam. <laughs> How are you, mate? Yeah. You all right? How much do you weigh, man? Eight stone. Eight stone? Mm -hmm. I'm four of you. When I first saw Michael, I was quite terrified. I'm roughly the weight of one of his legs. My first thought running through his head was that he needed a sandwich. I think that he is going to be rather shocked by my diet and I'm not going to pull any punches. Like, I don't think he'll manage it. Michael's going to be hungry. He might like what I eat, but he'll be hungry, because there won't be a lot of it. Weighing in at 35 stone, Michael is our heaviest supersizer, and his appetite is every bit as big as his personality. And he is going to be appalled at Sam's meagre sushi snacks with not a lot else. But their extreme diets are putting them at risk of serious health problems. And I'm hoping that by putting them together in the feeding clinic, they'll help each other to make a full recovery. 29-year-old Michael weighs in at 35 stone. This mountain of a man has a waistline of 71 inches, which is nearly twice the national average. Well, of course I enjoy food. Look at me. <laughs> Lean on the bed, the man, and watch my figure. I am a massive, massive carnival. Lamb, beef, chicken, turkey, duck, venison, rabbit. I eat a lot of meat. And not just a lot, but often too. Working three jobs as a youth worker, teacher and doorman, Michael's constantly eating on the run. I might be going from job one to job two, so I might pick something up on the fly. And then I might be going from job two to job three and I pick something else up on the fly. And then when I'm coming home, I might stop in like a drive through and, get, and pick up something and I'll see that as a snack. What I see as a snack is what some people will eat for a main meal and I'll go home and I'll eat again. So I'll probably eat about four or five, six times there. But on top of that, he's a super snacker. I call myself the world's worst grazer. My main weakness is crisps, unfortunately. Um, I'm like a cookie monster going at it, you know, nom, nom. But Michael's friends are alarmed by his endless eating. People are worried about him now that uh, he's not going to live much longer if, if he does keep on the way he is. And there's an emotional cost to being 35 stone. When you go onto a bus, you get stared at. You know, you've got to make sure, you got to be careful where you sit. When you go into a restaurant, you stare stared at. Sometimes it really gets to me. If I had one aim from doing this, it would just be to blend into the crowd and not be the focus of attention. But it's not just judgments of strangers that bother Michael. It's the fear his size could cost him his independence. I don't want to be one of those people that get so big that they're trapped in their bedrooms because being surrounded by four walls into a nothing is my idea of hell. Whilst Michael may be our largest supersizer this year, 23-year-old super skinny Sam Lancashire has some of the smallest measurements we've ever encountered. I'm six foot one with a 24-inch waist and a 34-inch chest. In women's sizes, that's a size zero. 
so slender that his company had to have his uniform made specially for him. I'm a flight attendant. I fly long and short haul routes. I work very varied hours, very long hours. Crossing time zones, running up and down aisles and taking care of everyone else's needs means that Sam frequently neglects his own. In a week I will normally miss six out of seven breakfasts and four out of seven lunches. And this is causing concern for his dad too. I am concerned about Sam. He's never been a big eater and now he's all over the place with his job. He's having breakfast at di dinner time and things like that. Skipping meals means that style-conscious Sam struggles to find fashion that fits. Shopping is a very frustrating experience for me. I generally can't fit into teen sizes or anything like that because you don't get many 6 foot 1 12 year olds. And now it's more than looks that are on his mind. I have been told by doctors that I'm prone to things like collapsed lungs, bad backs, because I'm so tall and thin. So that does worry me an awful lot. This is the one thing that I need to sort out for me now. This is what I need to do for me. But before they enter the feeding clinic, it's Michael's turn to jump on a flight, as Dr Christian's sending him to Virginia, USA, for a terrifying glimpse of his possible future if he continues on his current path. I'm scared of what I'm going to see out there because I think it'll be a massive reality check. Back home, there isn't anyone bigger than me, so perhaps to see that comparison and see someone that's bigger than me, I, you know, I'm guessing there'll only be a couple of stone off me, I think I, I think I would shock me because I don't see myself as other people see me, like, so it'll be quite interesting. Awaiting Michael's arrival in America is a former outdoors man, hunter and fisherman. My name is Jeff Mitchell. I'm 50 years old. I weigh 40 stone and eight pounds. I, I liken my problem, my eating disorder, to an addiction to heroin. It takes over your mind, it takes over your body, and it takes control of your life. Years of comfort eating and extreme weight gain mean that until recently, he'd been bedbound for three years. I might as well be in a, in a jail cell somewhere with somebody threw away the key because, you know, the, there's so little you can do. The only journeys he's made in recent years have been in an ambulance. Jeff suffered renal failure, pneumonia, lymphedema, chronic bronchitis and heart problems. I'm not the person I used to be. When my wife met me, I could uh, uh, walk these mountains and climb these hills. Father to nine-year-old Jed, Jeff put on so much weight that his wife Sherry had to give up her job to become a full-time carer. He gets depressed. He wants to be able to go and do things. He feels like he's not a good father, he's not a good husband. The depression makes him want to eat more, so it's a vicious cycle. Being trapped and reliant on the help of others is one of Michael's biggest fears. I'm terrified that seeing the glimpse of my future if I carry on the path I'm on. Hey, man. Hey. How are you doing? I'm all right. Good to see you. Good to welcome to Virginia. Well, pleasure, man. Glad Thank to you have you much. here. Thank you very much. How old are you? 29, mate. 29? 29. You know I'm 50, right? No way. This is my house. Welcome to the Red Roof Ranch Rehab and Social Club. <laughs> Fair enough, man. Just help yourself and go right in the front door. I'm going to go in the back door. There's no steps that way. No, no problem at all. And I'll meet you inside the house there. OK, meet you inside. All right. The short distance from the door to the bed leaves Jeff fighting for breath. Hey, homie. You OK? At 40 stone, okay. Jeff has a catalogue of serious health problems. My kidneys failed on me about two years ago. It was one of the worst nights of my life, and I was told that if I wasn't given medicines and I didn't start pushing some of that fluid out, that I would die, that I was in renal failure. Okay. Sepsis had took over, and that's when the infection in my leg got into my bloodstream. The surgeons came in and they marked on my leg. They were gonna cut my leg off. They were gonna just try to save my life. And on the third day, my body responded to the antibiotics. I, I, I couldn't think of any worse nightmare. 
I'm only what seven, eight stone off him. I'm not gonna end up like that. No. Can I see myself like it? Well, if I carry on the way I'm doing, then hell yeah. But it ends now. I'm, uh, I'm trying. No, no, sorry, not anymore. Coming up, Michael gets a traumatic insight into the difficulties of living with extreme obesity. You take your family with you. They don't get to go out and live a real life. I can't take my son to a baseball game. It's horrible. And Sam and Michael enter the feeding clinic, where things don't get any easier for Michael. Just an awful lot of food to have first thing in the morning. Thirty-five Stone Michael is in Virginia, USA, to get a taste of the day-to-day -day struggles of life at Forty Stone. Swelling in my legs is excruciating. The pain is just horrible. I've started noticing myself. I can't like muck about and run around on the beach like I used to without getting out of puff. As Michael and Jeff compare notes, Dr. Christian is on his way to Virginia to check that the shock treatment he prescribed Michael is working. Now, Jeff was previously a very fit, active guy. He enjoyed hunting, he enjoyed shooting, he enjoyed climbing up mountains. He's now basically confined to a wheelchair with completely limited mobility. Mike is still reasonably active. He still works as a bouncer. And I'm concerned that he thinks everything is fine and that he doesn't realize how quickly and how fast these problems do come on when they start. Watermelon good. Hey, Mike, hey, how man. are you? Hello, sir. How <laughs> Christian, are you? nice to see you. Wow. Pleasure. Jeff, I'm Christian. Hey, Christian. How are you? All right? How are you doing? I'm all right, thank you. Welcome to Bedford County, Virginia, man. Well, thank you for having me. So how's it going? How are you boys getting on? What we have in common both is we both got very quiet when we started eating. <laughs> <laughs> it was all, all attention diverted onto the food, right? Food is my heroin. Yeah. The problem with food is you need food all the time. It's always got to be around. Exactly. So it's a question of quantity control and quality control more than anything else. Right. And it's difficult. Jeff's addiction to food has cost him dearly, and Dr. Christian wants to make sure that Jeff's experience really does act as a warning for Michael. Jeff, what would you say your quality of life is like now? 
I call it trapped in my room. I've been trapped in my room for three years. Three years like this. Yeah. It must be horrific for you. And I, I can't, I couldn't even begin to imagine, you know, if I couldn't go out with my mates and have a drink. This is absolutely one of the worst ways to live your life. And you take your family with you. They don't get to go out and live a real life. I can't take my son to a baseball game. It's horrible. So I'm afraid that conversation in there was, well, it was quite upsetting. As if I found it very upsetting. And you found it upsetting, I think. If I ever ended up like that, if my mother had to see me like that, had to do everything for me, have to look after me like that, I don't think I could, I think I could live myself. Man. Do you think the memory, the picture of Jeff in his bed like that, really unable to do much at all, let's face it, you know, is, do you think that's going to stick with you? In, in crying in distress of what's happened to him, I mean, it's enough to deter anyone. It's just totally shocked me. Good. That, the call. that was the point. Dr. Christian heads off, leaving Michael to say goodbye to Jeff. I wish you only the very best from the deepest part of my heart. You too as well, sir. Oh, oh man. I enjoyed it. I found this trip to be a very enlightening experience. What shocked me the most is it's just his lack, lack of independence, his lack of freedom. And I'm looking very much forward to the next step now with, with the diet swap and I'm going to smash it to pieces in the next way possible. It's time to put good intentions to the test. Michael's back in the UK and checking into the feeding clinic for a two-day intensive stay. Joining him is super skinny meal skipper Sam. Sam's fed up of being skinny and struggling to find fashion that fits. He barely consumes 1,100 calories a day, the recommended intake of a toddler. In contrast, Man Mountain Michael has a BMI of 61.2, which is over twice what it should be. He eats over 5,000 calories a day in a diet packed with salt and fat. Dr. Christian hopes that their time spent at the clinic will give them insight into their dreadful diets. And with this in mind, they tackle their first breakfast. Michael starts the day with a fried egg and two slices of toast, then moves on to a large chicken tikka and spinach flatbread, a packet of crisps and a packet of rice cakes, and finishes it all off with a glass of diet cola and a green tea with one sugar. Versus Sam's breakfast of two oat biscuits and a latte. I'm guessing you'd be on the move when you're eating this, Sam. Mm-hmm. Are you in the air at this point, or have you just nicked them off a trolley? It's a two-hour commute for me to work, so I'll be having that on the way to work. I mean, there are other things you can grab on the way, man. I mean, like I say, you grab biscuits. I mean, you eat the wrap in your hand, I suppose. Yeah. Do you have this every day? Every day. Every day. When I stayed in my grandfather's house, I'd have egg and toast. Mm -hmm. It's just something I'm, I'm used to. It's just an awful lot of food to have first thing in the morning. Oh, yeah, definitely. I know there's, what is it you say, um, breakfast like a king, lunch like something and dinner like a pauper or something like that. Oh no mate, I'm a king all the time mate. <laughs> if I get another size portion like that, I'm going to be relatively scared for my life. If Sam thought breakfast was scary, lunch may well yeah. terrify him. Lunch, baby. Michael has two large rolls, each filled with a whole chicken breast, pickle, spinach and salad, two bags of crisps, a chocolate bar and two pints of Diet Cola. Two pints. Yeah, I'd basically around about this time I'd be getting tired mm. and need a buzz. And I noticed that you have nothing. I was clearly busy. Very busy. Mm. Enjoy! Thanks. Dude. Well, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what to say, man. The thing is with me, if food's not in front of me, I don't think about it. Really? Mm. Sorry. I don't apologise, mate. That's, that's, how I, that's why we're both here for, is a wake-up call, and my God. I was mortified when I saw that Michael had nothing. Such a lovely guy. And I'm like, I'm really sorry. Mm. I'm not, I won't lie to you, mate. If I had taken a bite of that, half of that would be gone. <laughs> it's a lot of food. Again, big portions. I don't see two sandwiches as big. I mean, if I was to pile, pile that on there, and there, and there. It just keeps going. 
and going. You, you may not eat it in that form, but that's what you're eating. It's you a, may... a melt in the clay. Mm. That's how I see it, though. It's too much. It's a reality smacking in you in the face. I was horrified. I'm done. We're good. Yeah, me too, man. I could eat another morsel. <laughs> but if Michael could squeeze something in, you can guarantee it'd be crisps. He admits to getting through a multi-bag in just one sitting. And with borderline high blood pressure, Dr <laughs> Christian oh, wants no. to hit him with the hard facts. Okay. That there is a year's worth of your crisps. A year's worth. It's, it's a hell of a lot of crisps. It's a, it's a couple of multi-bags worth, isn't it? Michael eats a whopping 676 packets of crisps annually. That's nearly two packets a day. It's a lot of fat and it's a lot of salt. Lots of salt. <laughs> Michael gets through a staggering five kilos of salt a year. More than double the recommended level. That's ridiculous. I had absolutely no idea that was what I was chucking in my system or you. It's quite sick, actually. High salt intake is linked to stomach cancer, osteoporosis, as well as high blood pressure. So Dr. Christian's worried that Michael is headed for disaster. Uh, that's this. What is wrong with that? This is something called a hemorrhagic stroke. So a blood vessel, essentially, has burst causing a massive great bleed into the brain, resulting in the death of this person. Jesus. High blood pressure, which is often caused by too much salt in the diet, puts the heart under massive strain, often leading to stroke and heart attack. I like my independence, I like to go and do what I want to do, so that if I had, if I was to have a stroke and then become disabled or something, that'd be my worst nightmare, like, I, I wouldn't want that. Having a stroke is nobody's fault but there are factors that you are in control of that can make having one of these less likely. And at the moment, you are doing everything possible to have a stroke and to have a heart attack. It's almost like you're working at it quite hard for it to happen. Okay. Think of it in that way. Uh, to be honest though, I think it's put me off crisps for life as I, I have no intention of ending up like that. Dinner time. And Sam's got a mountain of spaghetti bolognese with grated cheddar, half a garlic baguette and a pint of squash. Whereas Michael has a starter-sized portion of chicken Caesar salad. After seeing what I've seen today, I am absolutely amazed that for your job mm -hmm. and your commute and what you do and everything, mm -hmm. and you have existed on two biscuits, a cup of coffee and some rabbit food. I am absolutely amazed, as I'm sure you're shocked with mm. the sheer volume of food you've ingested today. <laughs> There's loads. There's an awful lot. Lots and lots, unfortunately. Soon, conversation turns to childhood. What about growing up? Who looked after you mainly whilst growing up? I was picked on a lot, so I would tend, I would leave school, go down my grandfather's house. Yeah. I'd eat food there. Yeah and, you know, I'd read the book, as you do, and then I'd go home and I'd eat again, and then it's just that reoccurring cycle. So, I remember you saying earlier on today that your granddad made you breakfast. Yeah. That's what you had with breakfast. So were you there a lot? I was in my grandfather's a very lot, you know, he was like, he, he was like uh, my best friend, and he was a very big influence on my life. And I lost the majority of my weight in 2006, when I went on holiday, when I come back, um, um, he fell ill, and uh, his cancer, and like, within three, four weeks, he, uh, he'd passed away. Mm, sorry about that. That's, that's okay. I put a lot of my weight back on after that because I was just, you know, my life was just a void. I didn't see the point. So... You did fill that void with food? Oh, yeah. I scream and uh, bourbon become my best friends. Mm -hmm. I wish... I, 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 I miss him terribly. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, a, he's a big hole in my life that he's not around anymore. Maybe I'm filling that with food, I don't know. 
perhaps, perhaps I am, but I miss him every day. I do feel sorry for him, but he's killing himself, isn't he, really? He needs the wake-up call of, Michael, come on, you're a nice man. You've got a lot to live for. Don't, don't let yourself down. Coming up, we meet a man who has beaten anorexia. Life excites me now, I'm 24 years old, like, come and get me. And the feeding clinic gets emotional. I just didn't expect my dad to have such an opinion on it. Hey, come on. Dr. Christian's in Las Vegas, investigating the obesity epidemic in the States. While Sin City takes a staggering $6 billion annually, it's not bright lights and easy streets for all its residents. Away from the high rollers, a recent survey found that 16% of people here are worried that they cannot afford their next meal. And many, many studies have linked poverty with obesity. A report published by the American Diabetes Association in 2011 found that people who live in the poorest areas of America are the most prone to obesity. Helping treat this problem is leading bariatric surgeon Dr. Thomas Umbach. I wanted to talk to you, Dr. Umbach, about the link between poverty and obesity, because that's been sort of pretty established, hasn't it? Is it something that you've noticed in your uh, practice? Absolutely. A lot of our patients are in dire straits. We have a lot of folks that are struggling struggling economically, struggling with the weight, and a lot of folks are struggling with both. What do you think are the causes for weight gain when you are poor? Is it food quality? Is it, what's going on? We see so many factors in play. There's certainly a role for genetics, there's a role for family, how you're raised in your family, psychological factors come into play, social and economic factors come into play, and all is one big pot. One of Dr. Umbach's patients is 43-year-old mother of two, Deborah. Hello, hello. Over time, Deborah has gained weight to the point that she was unable to work and found herself in a cycle of low income and bad food choices. Now weighing over 28 stone, she's hit crisis point. How hard would you say life is for you currently? I have two children and I cannot really do very many things with them. And I also used to have two jobs. Yeah. And as a result of not being able to stand, I can't do either of the jobs. So financially, you're not working. So it's fair to say you're really struggling right now. Yes, we are struggling. Financially, you're really struggling. Absolutely. Do you think it is possible to eat healthily on a budget? With just one of us working and my husband's hours are usually cut because everywhere it's cut. I have to honestly say it's very difficult. We end up going to food banks sometimes and um, what they give you is usually pasta, it's usually um, tons of bread, um, hot dogs, you know, very high fat, cheap, but to fill you up. That's what we've lived on for the last year. It is hard, it's, you know, it's hard to, pr to feel like you're Sorry. It's okay. It's hard to admit that you're defeated. 
something's got to be done so that I can get back to work and be able to provide for our family. And You're fighting this? Yes. Good. I am fighting it. As a last resort, Deborah's decided to have weight loss surgery, paid for by state-funded insurance. You ready for all this? I'm ready. Deborah's having a gastric bypass, which radically reduces the size of her stomach and subsequently how much food she can eat. With it, she hopes to lose two thirds of her body weight. This is hopefully the start of a new chapter in Deborah's life. The gastric bypass will mean that she can lose weight, get more mobile, and then look for work. There's still a long way to go, and she has a lot of challenges ahead, but this is a really good chance for her to lift herself and her family out of poverty. After 90 minutes of keyhole surgery and four days of recovery, Deborah's positive about the future. I feel great. I just started going for walks with my family. Um, this is a new thing because usually I'm on my scooter um, and they're running alongside of me. I, I feel better, I, I, I'm motivated, and of course it's gonna get, only get better. Since filming, Deborah has lost 100 pounds and is busy job hunting. It's day two in the feeding clinic, and Dr. Christian wants Sam and Michael to think more deeply about why their eating habits have become so unbalanced. They start by looking through some old photos. First one. Mm -hmm. How old were you here? Six, seven years of age. Oh. I don't think you look a particularly big six-year-old. Not at all. Yeah, I just look like a cheeky chappy. Yeah, you do. My, my, I think my weight started kicking in about 11, 12 years of age. I stopped going out. Right. Because right. I was picked on. So I, I would rather go down my grandfather's house and read a book. And then, you know, I'd eat in my grandfather's house, then I'd eat in my mother's house. Mm -hmm. And that's when I think the root of all the habits started. Kids are cruel, aren't they? Oh, yeah, I'd always turn to food as a source of comfort. Comfort eating when you're a kid, when you're getting picked on, has now changed to eating when you're stressed and when you're bored. You don't get picked on anymore, you just get stressed, so. And for Sam, there's a letter from home. Oh, it's from my dad. I know you often make light of your build, and I know deep down you'd really love to be have more bulk on your frame. You've never been a big eater, and although you love to cook, I think it's the fun of cooking and creating the meal you enjoy rather than the eating. I hope this programme of planned eating will enable you to gain the weight and looks you have strived for for so long. Good luck, love Dad. P.S. Note to self, you're grown up now and sandwiches can be eaten completely, even the crusts. That's really, really sweet. You right. I wasn't expecting that. Hey, come on. That's a fact. That's what parents are for, dude. Remind us we're human, after all. I just didn't expect my dad to have such an opinion on it. I guess he knows exactly how I feel. I will be. Got to gain this weight. And you will. Hey, right? Hey, mess. <laughs> okay, yeah, but it's so I'll be okay. Don't mess up. But just as their friendship begins to blossom, here comes lunch with the potential to ruin it all. Because all Michael has is an empty placemat. Dude! <laughs> Ain't you ever hungry? Whereas Sam's taking on a mammoth portion of Jamaican chicken curry and rice made with 700 grams of meat and a whole jar of sauce, a side salad, a chocolate bar, one pint of diet cola, a pint of squash and a large bag of crisps. Faced with so much food, Sam has a realisation. I enjoy making food more than I enjoy eating it. Yeah. But surely and my way of relaxing is chopping and cutting veg. I'm not fussed about the end product. I guess I just like making other people happy. <laughs> it makes everybody else happy when I cook them nice food. Fair enough. No, I'm good. I can't eat anymore. That is too much spice. It's fine, it's fine. Sam needs to realise how essential a balanced diet is to his health. He now needs to work out how he can make the time to make those all-important changes. Michael and Sam are coming to the end of their stay at the feeding clinic and it's time for their last supper. Oh, I got food. <laughs> Michael has a small sushi bento box, one udon noodles in miso soup and a handful of chocolate caramels. I love sushi. 
Sam's got two chicken breasts fried with mushrooms, served up on two packets of instant noodles, a huge plate of couscous, a chocolate bar, a bowl of bran cereal, an energy drink and a pint of orange squash. Bring it on. Once again, awful lot of food. Yeah, it's been a clear message over the uh, meals, isn't it? I need yeah. to cut everything in half, man. Oh my God, that's really nice. I'm sorry. That's gorgeous. I'll keep this, you keep that. <laughs> so tell me, what do you think you've had out of uh, the experience? I'm happy to be here and I'm very happy to have had this experience. You probably put a pound on at least, didn't you? At least. <laughs> I'm going to have to be a lot more organised than what I am with my food. Yeah. I'm going to have to stop worrying about everybody else. Yeah. And everything else, possibly. Well, you know, once you sort their heads out, the body will do what the mind says. So, everything I've seen over the course of the meals and everything I've done with Dr. Christian has really, like, given me uh, an education badly needed. So the meal swap is over and it's time for Dr. Christian to give Sam and Michael their personalised meal plans. So guys, you've done it. You've got to the end of the diet swap and you're going home. And it wasn't as bad as you thought, was it? No, it wasn't. I'll answer that for you. <laughs> Tim, Michael, this one's yours. Two things. Boredom, portion size. That's all I'm going to say. You know what I mean? 100%. Sam, this one is yours. And look, I know with your job it can be difficult. If this is going to work, Food has to come first. It has to be your number one priority. Do that and you'll see great successes. Both of you, good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael's plan drastically reduces his portion sizes and swaps crisps for healthier options, cutting his calorie intake by half to 2,500 a day. Sam's plan more than doubles his daily intake to 2,800 calories and calls for him to make time for meals. He needs to start eating breakfast and lunch and add healthy snacks in between. It's been eye-opening and the, yesterday was the hardest bit. My stomach was going all knotty and stuff. Quite clearly there are some issues that need addressing, such as my uh, salt intake and my portion sizes. A future. I have been very shocked and I've been very disappointed in myself. I always thought that I ate quite healthily and maybe what I do eat is healthy. I just don't have enough of it. Dr. Christian will be checking up on their progress in a couple of months' time. Look after yourself. I'll see you soon, right? Yep. See you later. See you later. <laughs> ah! Emma Wolfe is a journalist who suffered from anorexia for many years. Across this series, she's been meeting people affected by eating disorders, including recovered sufferers. I decided to start running. Before I knew it, I'd started to lose weight, and once I'd lost weight, I wanted to lose more. And those still fighting the battle. We will all be skeletons at one day, for sure. But uh, we're not supposed to live like skeletons. Today, she's on her way to meet Ashley, who we last saw in 2009, when he weighed just eight stone seven pounds and was gripped by anorexia nervosa. It's become, it's become its own terminal illness for me. And it's just a vicious circle where I'm just turning into this resentful, bitter, unfulfilled 20 year old. His bright future as a footballer fell apart after a hand injury, and it was then that Ashley's eating disorder developed. My dreams were shattered, I suppose. I then tried to get a grip of my life in other ways, and uh, food was the main focus for me then. He had lost three and a half stone in three years and was living off a diet of fruit and very little else. In 2009, Ashley decided to take part in a program on Super Size versus Super Skinny, in which his eating patterns would be challenged in a safe environment with the support of therapists. It's just a punishment thing, and I then adopted this attitude that I needed to earn my food. One of the most difficult tasks for Ashley was shopping for dairy products where low fat choices were not an option. I just want to get out of here. Just get whatever I need and just, I don't really want to be here. It's just, it's just 
It's just like, I just don't need this. It's just in the way. I feel like I've got to fit this mould. Four years on, Ashley has turned his life around. He's got a job he loves in the media and now weighs a healthy 12 stone. Since appearing on the show, lots of things have happened and I've sort of moved out of home and found myself a job that I'm so proud to be in of myself and I spent a long time not being proud of myself. And as his health improved, it's not just his professional life that's moved on, his personal life has too. Having a girlfriend now, which was something could never have happened and hasn't happened, hadn't happened in eight, nine years of my life. But recovery wasn't immediate after taking part in Super Size versus Super Skinny. It was a really tough couple of months because it still sort of scared me. The idea of letting food overwhelm me and it would take control of me and I would just become this fat mess that was just useless. I guess it's like dealing with a breakup. You're having a breakup with eating disorders and, you know, it takes a while to, it takes a while to get your head into the correct mind space. With the support from his family and healthcare professionals, Ashley did start to make progress. It went from eating Orange, uh, like oranges and jellies, and then introducing, it might be dried apricots or something like that, but pro, you know, progressing really slowly, little small steps, but small steps have got him where he is today. And... A defining moment in Ashley's recovery was running the New York Marathon in 2011. Never, never, never would I have been able to do that when I suffered. And it was like, you know what, if you can do that, if you can run a marathon, having gone through what you've gone through, there is no, there is no way you need to be worrying about these small things that you think are going to topple you. It really puts things into perspective. It's taken over five years, but with a lot of hard work and determination, Ashley is in a great place. Life excites me now, you know, and potentially excites me. I'm 24 years old, like, come and get me. You know, it's like, I'm. I've wasted enough time. Emma meets Ashley to find out more about life since anorexia. So Ashley, would you say now that you're fully recovered? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would. I mean, it's not a case of, um, I don't think it's as black and white as that. Um, and I'd never sort of rest on my laurels about it, but I really feel back to how I felt prior to me being sort of involved in the illness. And is it harder to admit to an eating disorder as a man? It, w it was very hard for me to admit because, for me, uh, my father's a very manly man. And it's not macho to have any kind of disorder as a man. There's almost this um, stigma that goes with being a man, that you need to be this masculine figure and mental health doesn't affect me because I'm a man. And yeah, I can't have an eating disorder, I'm a bloke. Exactly. What would you say to other people struggling with an eating disorder? The first thing I'd say is that just you need to, you need to realise that it isn't something to be ashamed of because it can happen to anyone. I, can, I, I still remember now that point where I hit rock bottom and it was like I either, this is either it for the rest of my life or things have got to change. And I think it's, a, I don't know if it's true, but for me, there was, that, there was that distinct crossroads and it was kind of all or nothing. And um, I'd say when you get to that point, it's just about having belief in yourself, you know. I've met a variety of different people in this series and investigated a range of different eating disorders. Everybody's at a different stage in their journey, but meeting Ashley today has reminded me that recovery is possible. It's not easy, but it's definitely worth fighting for. If you're worried that you or someone you know might have an eating disorder, speak to your GP or go to channel4.com slash supersize for more advice. Still to come, we find out how Michael and Sam have been getting on without Dr. Christian.
It's been nearly two months since meal skipper Sam and crispaholic Michael left the feeding clinic. But have they kept their resolve and stuck to Dr Christian's diet plans? I feel like I've got a lot more energy. Within myself, I feel a lot more confident. Bones are disappearing. Yay. Today I'm feeling nervous as hell. Judgment Day is finally here, so, uh, you know, we'll see what the scale says, and uh, like, I think I've lost something because I've gone down a shirt size. Michael, welcome back. Hello. It's nice to see you again. Tell me how your new, healthier lifestyle is going. Uh, it's going well so far. Um, gone back into training and uh, we've been hitting the gym. Probably. So you're exercising? Yeah. Good. And then what about your eating? I'm better prepared, so in my house and in my car there's always like um, a healthy snack option, so I don't go to the fast food chain in the morning. I have a bowl of cereal before I go to work, you know. Mm. One key point is that I've not eaten one bag of crisps since I left the clinic, not one. That was going to be one of my questions, really? The swimming pool of crisps has stayed with me all this time, and if I've got to eat something, I'll just grab a pack of jerky, which is low in fat, high in protein. The focus really for me as a doctor yeah. is all about health and your health risks at the weight that you were when we first met were really, really significantly high. And now every visit to the gym that you make and every pound yeah. that you lose will be reducing those risks. So um, I mean, I've, def I've definitely noticed there's no more issue with blood pressure anymore because had, I've had that checked since uh, you've left you and everything's A-OK -okay on that. So it's definitely going the right direction. What are you most proud of about what you've done? Uh, the fact I've stuck to it. Um, this is the most sustained period of time that I've ever stuck to it. And, you know, I've got the momentum behind me now, so I just got to make sure I carry it forward when I leave here today. Sam, it's good to see you back again. Tell me, how's it all been? Have you found it difficult to make changes, or have they all happened as I hoped? It has been extremely difficult for me to make some changes, unfortunately, but I've got there in the end. Um, I've sorted things so that I've always got something to eat when I'm not going to work. That was one of the big places that I missed food, was when I was on the road driving to work, because I've got a two hour commute. So these are big changes, actually. Yeah. You're planning and thinking ahead. The one thing that I have noticed is that food is a lot more on my mind now. I wake up and I'm hungry, uh, and I think I might have put a bit of weight on. You do, really? Why do you think that? Uh, I'm starting to fill out a little bit more, especially around my midriff, um, and mainly around my legs. It's time for Sam and Michael to be reunited. Oh my god. Hello again. Hi. Hi. Look at you. Oh, it's not that handshake, isn't it? Oh god. Oh. You're right, man. Hey, you look good, man. Yeah, you too. Crisps? Fizzy drinks? I haven't touched a bag of crisps since I left. Really? Oh, you can see my chin. I got you a chin. chin. I got a chin, chin now. My indicator was when one of the buttons flew off my uniform onto a customer, then I thought, it's clearly fitting now. Hey, yeah. look good, dude. So do you. I come bearing the all-important figures, the good news for you guys, because I know, Michael, you are itching for these numbers, aren't you? Yeah, with a combination of excitement and dread. But you've done well. You had a lot of hard work to do, both of you, didn't you? Definitely. Yeah, a lot of hard work. Sam, should we put you out of your misery first? <clears throat> All right, then. Have you gained or lost weight? You definitely have gained weight, Sam. You have listened to what I've said. You have made food a priority. You are eating regularly. I know you are because the scales don't lie. And actually, you've put on half a stone. Really? Really. Which is a phenomenal amount of weight to put on in such a short time. So fantastically well done. And also, you've put on four inches around your middle. Four inches. That's why your buttons ping off <laughs> when you're working. So really well done. Are you pleased with that? I'm really pleased. Michael, what do you think of that? It's a good effort, man. Half a stone is not bad, is it? Not at all, man. And what about you? Oh, I'd rather not know, man. Just put it in a postcard and send it to me, mouse. Well, Michael, you've lost three stone, eight pounds. That's over three and a half <laughs> stone you have done, <laughs> which is fantastic. Do you want some more numbers? Five and a half inches have disappeared from your belly and over four inches around your chest. Must be where the shirt's coming from. That's why the shirt's loose, the jeans are falling off you. You're a mess, man. Buy some new clothes. <laughs> Come on. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. You should be proud of yourselves, so keep going. But I'm really pleased. Well done. Thank you very much. I am definitely going to keep this up now that I know that I can gain weight. I mean, it's a great start. Half a stone is exactly what I wanted. Momentum's behind me, and I don't want to lose it, so I'll keep going until the job's done, because I won't stop until it's all off me. We'll definitely keep in contact, myself and Michael. We'll um, leg each other on and uh, tell each other off when we have a bit of a slip up. He's a good friend. 
If you are interested in taking part in a future series of Super Size vs Super Skinny, please go to channel4.com forward slash take part to find out how.